All right. Well, we're in Matthew 21 this morning, first 17 verses. Jesus enters uh, Jerusalem. Do a Palm Sunday message here because I have a shirt on that has palm branches on it. That's the only reason. And uh, then we'll have a uh, we'll look at um, at the first uh, Easter message uh, next week, which is Acts chapter two, 50 days after the resurrection day of uh, at uh, Pentecost. Peter gets up and preaches the first. Easter message uh, there on the resurrection where he gives uh, four reasons for uh, his audience to place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah offers an opportunity for them to respond so we'll we'll be doing the the same uh, next Sunday and then we'll jump into uh, chapter 37 of Genesis where we begin a great time for a break we'll begin the last section of the book the life of Joseph which is uh, just a uh, a wonderful, a wonderful study. I've been uh, looking forward to that for a long time. Well, let's pray before we uh, we get in here. Father, we ask you to bless our time as so we uh, study your word. We want to certainly uh, want to learn more and understand in a in a better way uh, what it was like that day in Jerusalem and uh, what it would have been like to stand there in the crowd and hear those cheers of the declaration that you were the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior of uh, not just the Jewish people, but of of the world. And um, so aware of the events that would uh, come about over the next several days after that. And we're aware from Scripture that uh, you you even wept looking upon the city, knowing the outcome. So, Lord, I pray that uh, you'd use your word in the stages to... uh, Minister to our hearts that we might, uh, again, as was done here, there's a confrontation at the end, but uh, Lord, to make that decision to receive or to reject. And Lord, for those of us that walk with you and call you our Savior and in our Lord, I, I pray that, uh, Lord, we draw closer to you. If there's anyone here that hasn't made that decision, you'd use your word to, to uh, draw them to yourself this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes we kind of, uh, uh, you know, don't always catch all the dynamics of what's, uh, what's going on. And especially when we're not doing our normal verse-by-verse study uh, in Matthew, we're just kind of <laughs> jumping right in. But uh, to kind of give you a flavor of what's happening, remember that the confrontation with the corrupt Jewish leadership, I say corrupt because that's what Jewish history says about Caiaphas being the high priest, his father-in-law, Annas, who really called uh, the shots for uh, everything, uh, they were appointed uh, by Rome in their position uh, and in no way compared to the high priest that we read about in most of the, uh, the times of, of Moses and the early days of, of Solomon's temple. They were not spiritual men. They were very, very corrupt, as long, uh, along with not all, not all, but uh, much of the Sanhedrin that was made up of the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees. Uh, they see Jesus as a great threat. They've already determined to kill him. It's just a matter of where. It's a matter of when. We'll read a reference to say the last thing they wanted to do is during, the, during this feast, the feast of Passover, and unleavened bread because they were concerned about the crowd. So you have that dynamic. Jesus, because of that, has left the vicinity. Uh, Martha and Mary have asked him to come back to Bethany, just over the hill from Jerusalem. It's, it's closer then from here to Kailua town, it's closer than that. It's only, it's only two miles. And uh, uh, it's, further, it's, it's as far as from my, my house to Starbucks <laughs> in the Channel Lakes. I can tell you, that's about two miles. Uh, it's close. And uh, Lazarus has died. He's a prominent person. He's, uh, he's wealthy. Uh, he's looked up to. Uh, and, uh, and he dies. And you remember the story from John 11. <laughs> Uh, they call for Jesus. He delays his coming intentionally until he knows that Lazarus is dead. And in the tomb, he comes back and, uh, and raises him from the dead. And you know from our study in John 11, then that sets in motion a series of events. We compared them to dominoes that just begin to, uh, to fall. That lead to the next thing is this event and this crowd that is so huge I'll give you the scriptural support for that. That is so huge because of what happened in John 11, raising Lazarus from the dead. The crowd is, uh, is uh, uh, I'm just going to say at least 50,000. Aloha Stadium holds 50,000 
Uh, it could be bigger than that. Uh, it'll make reference to the great multitude. It'll use another phrase, multitudes, plural. Now, when, how big is that? When Jesus feeds the 5,000 of men, plus women and children, that was a multitude. So a multitude is thousands, maybe 10, 12, 15,000, a multitude. This is multitudes, so it's tens of thousands. Josephus tells us there's two to three million people jammed in the city. Were half of them there? Were a third of them there? We don't know, but it was, it was huge, this crowd. And we're going to find that they are proclaiming Jesus to be uh, the Messiah. And all this is leading to uh, really uh, where Jesus confronts, again, this corrupt Jewish leadership. Once again, although they have already in one moment rejected him as the Messiah, he'll confront them once again. You're going to have to either accept me or you're going to have to reject me. And of course, this would lead to their rejection, we know, and his being arrested and going to the cross. So a lot of dynamics, uh, a lot of drama going on here. Uh, the other thing about it that uh, uh, you need to know that is uh, kind of unusual is that uh, today when we have Passover, uh, it's a time of celebration. It's a big family time. We have a good time, a lot of good food. We read through the, uh, uh, the, all of the, uh, the references to uh, the original Passover. Uh, and it's a, it's a fun time. It wasn't in Jesus' day. It becomes a family time, a fun time, after the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. It becomes a family event. But up until then, it was a solemn time. The Feast of Sukkoth or Booth, that was a time of great celebration, a lot of fun. But uh, this is a time when you're going to bring that lamb, and that lamb is going to be, be slain, and his blood is going to be poured out for your sins. So the angel of death, in a sense, will pass over you. They'll celebrate going on, very solemn. But that's not what we find here. You showed up for this Passover in the first century, you got this huge crowd, they're going crazy. They're going crazy celebrating, cheering. The Savior's here, the Messiah's here, he's the one. This is very, very unusual dynamics to anybody that shows up in the city on this particular day. And we'll see from Daniel's prophecy, it was a particular day. Well, let's look at the first three verses. We'll note that G uh, Jesus made final preparation before entering Jerusalem, it says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to uh, Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, Bug out, brother. No, that's not quite it. Says. It says, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will uh, send them. Uh, and the fir first thing we note about the preparation, uh, he does what he always does, which is, uh, again, they stay in the home of uh, Mary and Martha. They come up over the top of the hill, the Mount of Olives, and they head down looking towards the Kidron Valley, that kind of classic view that you have on <laughs> postcards and, uh, and pictures today of, uh, looking, uh, of Jerusalem, looking down onto the Temple Mount area. And, um, and as they come down, halfway down, there's a garden. Uh, and uh, it would be the place that he would always go with, in a sense, to get his guys together and say, okay, there's the temple. We're going to go here. We're going to do this. We're, he briefs them before they go in. After their day in the city, they would come out, always the same way, and come back to that same little staging area, and he would debrief on what had transpired. They said this. I said this. Why did you do this? And he would go over things with them then up over the hill and uh, back to uh, Mary and Martha. So uh, it's why when Judas wants to betray him, <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus is really keeping things fairly secret at this point uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is there's a betrayer. Uh, and that's why when Judas wants to betray him, he goes, well, I know one place he's going to be at the end of the day. It's going to be uh, there in the, this particular garden setting. So he makes his final preparations there on the side of the, the Mount of Olives. Uh, and the second thing, he does it by sending two disciples into the city. And, of course, we might think that uh, Jesus is the victor here, not the victim. Uh, wouldn't he be riding a great white horse? But, again, in that day and age, uh, the typical soldier going into the battle, the leader of, of those, would w ride that great white horse going off hoping 
hoping to be victorious. If he was victorious, that he could be willing to be vulnerable so he could ride in on something much lower than that. Uh, Jesus does this to make a point, but also in fulfillment of, of Scripture. He does it in secrecy, again, because there's a betrayer among them who is looking for an opportunity to sell Jesus out, to find a place in a time where he could be arrested. There's another factor involved as well. People have already been told, if you help Jesus, you'll be excommunicated. You can't go in the temple. You cannot worship. We'll kick you out of the synagogue. We'll make it public, and we'll embarrass you. Uh, and we see one incident of that in John chapter 9. Jesus has healed a man that was blind. He was blind from birth, so there was no doubt that this was a miracle. He's called into question who healed him because he's rejoicing in the temple. He says, I don't know. All I know was I was blind and now I can see. Of course, they certainly suspect that it was, uh, that it was Jesus. So then they call his parents in and, uh, and they question them. And that's in, the, again, John 9, 21. Uh, but by what means? They're saying he now sees we don't know or opened his eyes. We don't know. He's of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. His parents said that these things because they feared the Jews, the Jewish leadership. For the Jews had uh, agreed already that if any would confess that he, Jesus, was Christ, the Messiah, he would be put out, put out of the synagogue. It means uh, excommunicated. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. So there's some secrecy going on. You two guys, you go over here. It's there. If they need saying, master needs it. You know, it's all set up. Ahead of time. Jesus has made these arrangements, even for the upper room. You know, you, you two, you'll go get the Passover lamb. You'll meet us. It'll be at this place. You follow him because he cannot allow anything to disrupt that meeting and his explanation of the Passover and what it would mean in the future in terms of the, of the new covenant. So the preparation is done as he enters. To some degree, there's some secrecy involved, uh, but he did it. Secondly, in fulfillment of prophecy, and we see that in verses 4 to 7. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Uh, they brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes uh, on them, and he sat on them. So he fulfills prophecy by Writing this donkey, Zechariah 9 9 is the scriptural reference. Prophet Zechariah says that when the Messiah comes, uh, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Notice he is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a, of a donkey. Notice when he comes to the cities of Jerusalem, the citizens there, he's coming. Uh, bringing them salvation. Now, Luke 19.30 tells us that colt had never been uh, ridden, and uh, this is significant if, uh, if you're Jewish, uh, because uh, they believe that the first person to ever use an animal, sit on an animal, the first time it was used, that was its really intended purpose. That was what it was born for. For example, the red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer, were used specifically to cleanse the temple, make sacrifice for sins. That red heifer could have never been yoked or used in work. It was used in work, that was its purpose. But it had a special purpose, it could not have been yoked before. This colt, the foal of a donkey, had never been ridden, and that would be significant. It means that it was for this purpose that it was born to bring the Messiah uh, into Jerusalem on this particular day. Now, again, so Zechariah says when the Messiah comes, he will come into Jerusalem riding on the full, this, this colt, the foal of a donkey, exactly the way that Jesus does. Secondly, uh, he comes and he arrives, we would say, uh, exactly on time. Now, Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 prophesies the exact day that Jesus, the Messiah, would come into <laughs> Jerusalem. And if you were here for our studies uh, in Daniel, we went into this in some, uh, some length and some detail. And if you want to go back and listen, it's, it's online. But just to kind of hit, hit the high points and to test your math skills uh, this morning, uh, Daniel 9.25, the prophet writing says, Now therefore and understand 
that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And, uh, and so there's some specifics. Uh, there is going to be a command given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem with a wall. NIV, NIV says with a wall and with a moat. So uh, there's some specific things that have to happen. And then Daniel says, and then from that, you can start counting the days until the Messiah will, uh, will show up. Uh, Longomanius uh, Artaxerxes is the one that gave the command to rebuild. Uh, and that's recorded in Nehemiah 2.1. It was in the year 445 uh, B.C. Uh, so you can start counting. Again, the seven sevens, uh, uh, you can just multiply it out. We would say decade, and we mean 10 years. Uh, the word here for sevens uh, is Shavua, and it also means a seven-year period uh, of time. So you get the 490 years. He also mentioned uh, another period of time, uh, excuse me, uh, again, uh, where it's broken down into a seven-year period. I think I've got a little graph for you. And you can just keep punching them, Kathy, until they go, all pop up. But uh, you've got the 69 weeks, the 493 years he's mentioned. And then the other week or the other seven-year period, 490 altogether. Daniel breaks it in two, two different periods. He says that from the proclamation uh, the, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem with its wall and with its moat, you can count 483 years. The Messiah is going to show up. Later, he would say the Messiah is going to be cut off. And there'll be another seven-year period, and that period of time is broken up half a week and a half a week, or 1,260 days, or three, three and a half years each. That's the Great Tribulation, and uh, that last seven-year period before Christ returns to, to planet Earth. So 483 years. So uh, did Jesus come uh, 483 years later? Well, again, according to a Babylonian, or we would say a prophetic calendar of 360 days a year, again, I know many of you have already done the math, 173,880 days. Uh, so from the issuing of that command, uh, it was given in the Jewish month of Nisan. You thought that was a car. Uh, it would have begun on the 14th of March, 445 BC. So uh, easy to identify that first date. Uh, and that would take us uh, 173,880 days to April 6, 32 AD. And again, when we did our study, we went through, uh, spent a lot, of, a lot longer making sure you're all tracking along with that, but you've got a decree that's going to be issued, 173,880 days. The prophet Daniel says the Messiah is going to become. He's going to come publicly. It will be, it will be obvious is, uh, is the idea like Jesus is coming here. So the question is, how do we know that Jesus came into Jerusalem on April 6, 32 AD? The April 6 is easy because it's a Sunday just prior to Passover during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it's easy to track that date. In terms of the 32 AD, uh, in our study, we give you three references. Two from Roman history. One's recorded in, uh, in John chapter 2 in regards to when Herod built the temple. The second one is in Luke 3, 1. It's in regards to the reign of Tiberius Caesar. We can take what the scripture says and cross-reference it with Roman history and know that we're at 32 AD on this particular day that Jesus comes in. The one I want to uh, spend a little time on, the third reference is from the words of Jesus himself because they are more than a little interesting. Luke 19, verse 37 says, Then as he, Jesus, was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, it was the day that Daniel prophesied, the things that would make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will, will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you 
and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, which occurred uh, uh, via Titus, the Roman legion, 70 AD. And Jesus says, it occurred, it will happen, because you did not know the time of your visitation. So <clears throat> Zachariah says when the Messiah comes, he's going to come very publicly. He's going to come <clears throat> lowly and riding on a donkey, exactly the way Jesus did. Daniel says when he comes, it's going to be 173,880 days after the decree is issued, an official decree to restore and build Jerusalem with its walls uh, and its moat and so forth. And Jesus comes exactly on the day Daniel said that he would. So Jesus makes final preparation to come into the city on that day. All of these events stemming from raising Lazarus from the dead, now leading in to the city where he's going to be proclaimed to be the Messiah. It's in fulfillment of the prophecies of, it's going to be on the test, Zechariah 9 and Daniel 9. See how easy it is? Zechariah 9 and Daniel 9. In fulfillment of those two scriptures, and this is all for the point of this final confrontation with the Jewish leadership there in the temple, which would be the following day, leading to his arrest, leading to his crucifixion, reading, leading to his resurrection. So fulfillment of prophecy, he then is proclaimed to be the Messiah as he enters the city. We see that in verse 8 and 11, similar to what we just read in Luke. It says, and a very great multitude, we've already described a multitude as uh, 5, 10, 12, maybe 15,000 people. This is a great multitude. Spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees uh, and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitudes, plural, said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So several things about the proclamation. The first one is, know that they did it with their cloaks and the branches laid on the road. <clears throat> the idea of laying cloaks down is uh, something that would be done to welcome a king. We see that in uh, in 2 Kings, uh, verses, uh, chapter 9, verse 11 and 13, Jehu is one of the kings of, uh, of, uh, of Judah. As he's coming into the city, the same thing occurs. So they're welcoming Jesus as, as the king. Uh, uh, secondly, they're doing something very unusual, separate and distinct from that, where we get this idea of Palm Sunday. <laughs> I don't know if they cut down palm branches or not. It just says they cut down branches, uh, and they, uh, they, they were waving those. You know, and cheering, uh, cheering him on, just like in the movies. And, uh, and they're doing that. That's where we kind of derive the name Palm Sunday. But a lot of Jewish writers say that the significance of that uh, is the fact that they saw Jesus doing this in fulfillment of another Jewish feast, uh, what we call the Feast of Sukkoth or Booth or Tabernacles, normally in the fall, not, not during Passover. So this is very unusual. you got a crowd that's normally somber, Right? screaming at the top of their lungs going crazy because they believe Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. And they're showing that he's the king by putting their clothes down in front of them. But they do this other thing that is not fitting also for that particular feast, which is to wave these branches. Remember, the Feast of Booth is the time still celebrated by uh, Jews today where they move out of their home, usually in the fall, in time, uh, usually about October or so, they move out uh, of their home, they build a little canopy and stuff, and they, they basically camp out for a week or so. So when their children ask, and why are we doing this? They will be able to say, we are doing this to remind ourselves that our forefathers once wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, uh, and God was faithful. God brought them into the land and into the promised land and kept all the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the centuries and through the years, and he gave them the land. So we celebrate and remember in this day. That, that feast is a big, uh, a big celebration. Uh, what they are doing here is what they would normally do during Sukkot. They're cutting these branches down as they would to build their booths. They are celebrating as they would during that time. Because they are celebrating the fact that God has been faithful to his word. God has delivered us not only into the land, but he's given us the Messiah. 
who will set up his kingdom and rule and reign forever on the throne of David. And they're more than a little excited. So there's a lot of dynamics that are going on here. Uh, the other thing just to mention as well is that sometimes I cringe when I hear people teach uh, that this crowd is the same crowd that only a few days later was saying, crucify him, crucify him. These are not the same people. Uh, th that, you know, that group of people was a bunch of, of people from Jerusalem itself in, in loyalty to this corrupt leadership of few in number that could fit in Pontius Pilate's courtyard, not tens of thousands and thousands, a few that are in there those are the ones yelling as they were paid and instructed, crucify and crucify. The majority of all the people, the entourage that followed Jesus down from Galilee, that are more familiar with his ministry, all of those who've just heard recently about him, uh, but also realized because he, he was able to raise Lazarus from the dead, all the other things he did to authenticate who he was, how he's coming, the day he's coming, he's the king, he's the Messiah, he's the savior, they're more than a little excited. Notice that they quote from Psalm 1, uh, 118. Uh, and again, one of the things about Psalm 118 uh, is that it's the psalm that is sung by the priest as they are actually sacrificing the lambs, which they would be doing in a few days. As they're doing it, they would be singing this particular Hello song. We see it in Psalm 118, starting in verse 19. Open to me. You thought I was going to see the whole, sing the whole thing. Just check and see if you're still here. Uh, I'm not going to sing it, but they would be singing it. Uh, is, and it goes like this, the whole thing. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Uh, this was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. It's a prayer. Save now, I pray, O Lord. That's what the people are, uh, are saying. Save now, I pray. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Ever sing that song and thinking, yeah, I hope I'm going to have a good day now. That day is the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. This is sung over those lambs that are being killed and their blood being poured out for the forgiveness of the sins prior to Jesus. He is the one who is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Actually, when we sing that song, we may not be thinking that way. But when we sing, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. We rejoice because it's the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross as the Lamb of God to take away our sins. That's why we're rejoicing. That's what makes our day. The psalm continues in verse 25 and says, O Lord, I pray sin now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. And certainly this is all about Jesus coming as the Savior, as the Messiah. But it also speaks of the sacrifice, though they didn't really put that together. He was about ready to make for their sins. Luke 19 gives us this little detail that's interesting. In the same account there, Luke 19, 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd and said, Rabbi or teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep <laughs> silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Why are the Pharisees so concerned? Well, they don't like the popularity of Jesus. They certainly don't like the fact that he's being proclaimed to be the Messiah. But they're more than freaked out a little bit that you've got tens of thousands of people on a Roman highway proclaiming somebody else to, is king who is not Caesar. That's called treason. Uh, and they all could be in a lot of trouble. And these guys are saying, will you rebuke them and stop? And Jesus says, no. If they don't cry out, these stones on the ground will cry out. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. And uh, people are rejoicing and are glad in it, regardless of this corrupt leadership in Jerusalem. The third thing about the proclamation, it's, uh, it's made because, again, uh, the miracles that he has done. 
And uh, I want to go to John chapter 12, verse 16. And here's the, uh, the, my little proof text to show that this all, all stems from, and it starts from, the raising of Lazarus from the dead in John 11. And if you're here for any of the times that I've, uh, uh, I've taught on that, I try to do that at least once a month. No, I occasionally teach on it because uh, I just think it's a, a, a great thing for us to understand uh, the idea that Mary and Martha were greatly disappointed with Jesus, but God in his plan of redemption had something else totally in mind. And Jesus needed to not answer their prayer. And Jesus needed to not come when they wanted him to. And Jesus needed to delay his coming so that Lazarus would be in the tomb and dead for all to know and see so that when he called him out of that tomb, word would spread and we would have this event happen the way that it did uh, on Palm Sunday. But here's the proof text for that, John 12, 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified and then remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him, therefore the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness for this reason, the people also met him here on this day, on this road, because they heard that he had done this sign, the sign of raising Lazarus from the dead. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the, the first domino that drops, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. This is the second one. It sets this event up. It leads to, as we'll see in a moment, a confrontation with the Jewish leadership for the very last time, what sets in motion what they did not want to do, which is his arrest. The fourth thing about the proclamation is that they refer to him as the prophet. That's in verse 11. This is Jesus, the prophet, not a prophet, not among the prophets, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses had predicted a long time ago there would be another one that would come that would be like me, a, a prophet from God. And he describes him, and it was certainly thought in, in, uh, among the Jews that he would be the Messiah, the prophet. Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from, among, from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. The prediction there would be a prophet greater than all the other prophets and Moses says, when he comes, you'd better listen to him. And that's what the inference is there in verse 11. So there's preparation before he goes in. There's got to be some secrecy about it because there are those that want to kill him. There's a betrayer among him. There's already the threat of excommunication to anyone that helps him. Uh, he comes in fulfillment of these prophecies, Zechariah 9 and Daniel 9. And as he comes, he is absolutely proclaimed undoubtedly, to be the Savior, the Messiah, uh, the, the Christ, the Savior of the world. That leads to this event in verse 12 then, where he confronts those in positions of leadership. Verse 12, then Jesus went to the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise? Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. The confrontation begins by, well, we're kind of familiar with this. It's the next day. He's already cursed the fig tree as a sign that he explains to his disciples later what that's all about. He comes down again to their stage and area uh, there, the Garden of Gethsemane. We refer to it. He comes on down the Kidron Valley. He enters from the south side like he always does and goes up into the temple area. Again, we're talking about an area of uh, four and a half acres or so. It's a large area. There's lots of courtyards for teaching and so forth before you ever get to the temple proper. And he's in those areas teaching and ministering. Uh, and he comes to the place where people are buying and selling because in that day there were Egyptian and Syrian, Greek, 
Iranian coins, <coughs> it had to be exchanged so you could pay the temple tax, tax with a shekel. And of course, we know historically, and we know even from Jewish writers like Josephus, uh, they were charging an enormous amount uh, to, to get this thing. It's, it's kind of like going to the theater and buying popcorn. You're pretty sure that that popcorn is not worth $50. Isn't that what they charge? About $50 for a bag of popcorn? I think it's something like that. I think it used to be 1000 and they've reduced it down to 50 And uh, <clears throat> Kathy always asks me, can we get popcorn? And I always say, if you have to, but don't tell me how much it costs. <laughs> I, I don't even want, I wouldn't even be able to enjoy the movie if I know we paid $50 <laughs> for popcorn. <laughs> anyway, it's that kind of a thing. It's very obvious to everybody that uh, the exchange rate is, is ridiculous. And it's why if you go to Jerusalem today, <clears throat> it's not always on the tour, but you could go to the archeological remains of Caiaphas in Annas' home. Oh, it's not a home, it's a palace. Uh, they lived in the lap of luxury. They made tremendous amounts of money off of the people coming in. And then, of course, you had to, very difficult to travel several hundred miles, bring in your lamb, so you bought a lamb there. It's kind of too bad that the lamb out there cost $20, but you're charging in here 125 So Jesus is not the first time. Earlier in another trip, coming for a feast day, he does the same thing. Overturns the tables. He makes the statement, of course, by by saying that uh, this is my house and you've turned it into a, a den of thieves. He does it by quoting scripture, Jer Jeremiah 7, 11. Uh, in Psalm uh, 8, 2, he makes a statement about the fact that this is a place where people are to come in and commune with God, give their, cur their cares and their concerns and, and have the Lord minister to them. But you've turned it into something it was never designed to be. He confronts them by healing again the blind and the lame in fulfillment of Isaiah 35, 5, once again authenticating his power and his Messiahship. And keep in mind, when Jesus healed, they were absolutely 100% healed. And Jesus didn't just heal a few people. He healed everybody they brought to him in the Galilee. He healed probably tens of thousands of, uh, of people. Uh, and then he confronts them uh, by asking a question about the praise of children. Do you hear, hear what these children are saying? saying, and Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you've perfected praise, Psalm 82, which uh, again, he's saying even these kids praising here is a fulfillment of, of scripture. And I think that's why I, uh, you know, enjoy when I get a chance uh, poking my head in the door to, you know, hear the kids uh, worshiping over there, because I think the younger they are, the more sincere. Did you get this? Jesus is saying that uh, that babies and small children, their worship is probably the purest worship. Is, is that what that's saying? I think that's what it's saying. They're not really intimidated by, by other, do you ever hear the kids, and they're, they're, we call it singing, they're just screaming at the top of their lungs. What, and I, I won't have much of a voice if I try to imitate what they do here, but uh, uh, you know, it's just, it's kind of a crack up, it's kind of cool, but actually, as far as God is concerned, he can look into the heart of a child and know that a child, when that child is actually really totally given his heart to him and he's worshiping him. Boy, it really says a lot about uh, uh, the ministry to the kids and, and how important it is and how important it is to, to lead to them to the Lord very, uh, very early on. But Jesus, again, does not spend the night here uh, in the city as we've seen uh, uh, on his uh, uh, previous trips as well. Uh, but he enters the city for the purpose of confronting the Jewish leadership, and certainly uh, he does that. Now remember, uh, in Matthew 26, 4, it says of them that they plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him, but they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Jesus was going to confront them to get them to do what they did not want to do, which was to arrest him and kill him so that he dies during Passover, and he's able to rise again three days later, as predicted, in fulfillment of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He comes into the city on the day he was supposed to, he comes right back in the next city and continues the confrontation with this very corrupt Jewish leadership. Jesus was the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world, and many times, we know on one occasion when the crowd wanted to make him king by force, 
And he just simply eluded them and went away because he says he knows what's in the heart of man. He said, on many occasions, my hour has not yet come, uh, but now his hour had come. And the confrontation is there once again to accept or to reject. Would there be peace on earth? John 1.11 says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Uh, his house was to be a house of prayer, uh, but it had become something else. It had become a, a room full of televangelists. <laughs> it was in the court of the Gentiles. It was the only place where a, Je a Jewish person that's been sharing with their Gentile friend that there is one true God and you can know him. Uh, and what has separated and kept you from knowing him is your sins. But he has made a way through a covenant relationship with us whereby an animal's death can atone, not completely taken away, but atone and cover your sins. And one day he's going to bring his Messiah. He's going to set up his kingdom. Come in here. Let me show you what it's all about. And then they get in here. You've got people just making sport of the whole thing and ripping people off. And it infuriated uh, Jesus. It was a place where, in a sense, we would say evangelism was supposed to be taking place. So important that people don't get misinformed and have misinformation uh, about who Jesus is and the way to, to know him. On his way to the cross, this is kind of the second domino. If the first one was, <coughs> was uh, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. The second one was his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The third one had to be coming back the next day and confronting one final time the corrupt Jewish leadership that would lead, of course, to his arrest and eventually his crucifixion. <coughs> I read, uh, I'd heard a story about a, a group of people in Cambodia that accepted the Lord almost in mass in a small village as soon as the gospel was presented to them uh, and, and why that happened. I finally kind of came across the documentation for the story. It's recorded uh, in a book named uh, by Ellen Vaughn. Uh, and the title of the book is The God Who Hung on the Cross. And, uh, and it's because of this incident. Uh, of course, if you're... Um, Oh, like me, you know, that uh, post-Vietnam, uh, post uh, when we, we pulled out of Vietnam, one of, the, uh, one of the things that happened, of course, is the, uh, the communist of, uh, of North Vietnam swept through uh, and uh, into the South, and there was uh, a lot of bloodshed as a result of that. And one of the spin-offs of the other thing is that another communist named Pol Pot then went into Cambodia and basically butchered and killed uh, every male in the country if you were not with them. And uh, uh, been, it's been documented in, uh, in film uh, and, uh, and in books. And uh, the remains of that uh, remain uh, in uh, some of the cities like Phnom Penh uh, today, uh, what was referred to as the killing fields. Uh, while he was doing that, there was a group uh, in, uh, in northern Cambodia, again uh, documented in the story, where in 1999, uh, a pastor, a Cambodian pastor, uh, it's, there's a name, but then it says it's not his real name, uh, he travels to uh, northern Cambodia, uh, and he's going to be sharing the gospel. And as I mentioned, he shares the gospel, and the people just openly re receive uh, the gospel. Uh, and he's, uh, you know, certainly overjoyed. But a little amazing as he begins to talk uh, with the people afterwards. An older woman says that uh, uh, when he said, uh, why do you think that people were so receptive to the gospel? She said, because we've been waiting for you to come for 20 years. She said, 20 years ago, the soldiers of Paul Pot came into this uh, village. Uh, and they said they were going to kill every one of us. And we knew they had done that with other villages. <clears throat> they asked us to first dig all of our graves, uh, in which we did. Uh, and then as we stood over our graves, uh, people began to just cry out. The spiritists cried out to, to demons. Uh, some cried out to their ancestors. The Buddhists cried out to Buddha. But one woman, remembering a story her mother had told her years ago about a God who hung on a cross and died, she began to cry out to the God who hung on the cross. Because she thought in that moment, a God who hung on a cross would be a God who is merciful and full of compassion and understand our predicament today. <clears throat> All this crying and screaming is, uh, is going on and pretty soon 
the only voice that can be heard is the, uh, they all join in to all cry out to this one God, the God who died on the cross. And uh, as they were done and, and the tone died down and there's just basically crying and sobbing left, there seemed to be a silence that came upon the crowd and eventually somebody turned and looked and all the soldiers were gone. And so the God that hung on a cross had saved them. And so they were waiting and waiting and waiting for someone to come and tell them about that God. So you can understand when he, this pastor shows up from southern Cambodia and preaches the gospel about uh, and Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross for your sins. And uh, it all made sense to them. And they all openly receive the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. Because to them it was important to know. And the way they came to know him was he was a God who had compassion and had mercy because he had experienced what they were about ready to go through. Certainly that's the, the story of the death of Jesus on the cross. Uh, Jesus is going to push through. We can't, we can't uh, probably understand or, or estimate the sheer courage of what Jesus did riding in the city on that day. Uh, he knows exactly what awaits him. He knows exactly what he's going to go through. And because of that, in the garden, as you know, he prayed three times. Father, if there's another way, another way for us to have salvation, then take this cup from me. In other words, if we could do good works, if we could do certain things, if there's something we could do to be saved, then let's do that. But there was no other way. So he said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And, uh, and he goes to the cross for our sins. And next week on Sunday... We'll again look at that <coughs> first Easter message and, uh, and celebrate his, his resurrection. Well, it is.